Okay, so um, we have the esteemed Zach Green here to speak with us. Um, he comes, so the PTCB office is in Washington, D.C., but Zach, do you still live in Florida? Okay, so Zach comes to us from the great state of Florida. Um, and I think we're all familiar with him, um, but I'm sure he'll give you a little bit of his background when he comes up. So please help me in welcoming Zach. Hello, everyone. Um, so today I'll be presenting Making the Case for Advanced Pharmacy Technician Roles. Well, this will probably be a little bit more conversational in a, as a pre in a presentation because I kind of want to hear from you all about your paths as uh, pharmacy technicians and how it fits into a national landscape and how that all builds on advancing the profession. <clears throat> so I currently serve as the Associate Director of Partnership Development at PTCB and um, most recently have been asked to chair the Pharmacy Technician Educators Council which is the newest division of PTCB. This is association membership um, that represents pharmacy technician educators. This is my disclosure. I'm just that I'm employed by PTCB. So I'll describe some advanced pharmacy technician roles and then explain the impact advanced pharmacy technician roles have on the practice of pharmacy. Identify practice settings for advanced pharmacy technician roles and then discuss state and federal regulations that impact pharmacy technician roles and responsibilities. So let's do a quick snapshot of the current practice. Um, this is a slide that I've included in many of my presentations over the years, which I find uh, interesting that hasn't been updated all over all this time. But the BLS um, defines pharmacy technicians as those who help pharmacists dispense prescription medication to customers or health professionals. So it's a very general, very vague definition of what pharmacy technicians do. About 447,000 um, in the United States uh, as of 2020. There are various points of entry to be a pharmacy technician. So I'll start with board regulation. Um, this is usually where a lot of uh, confusion comes in between registration, licensure, and certification. Oftentimes those terms are used interchangeably and they mean all different things. So registration is quite simply, you can think of it as being put on a list um, just by the Board of Pharmacy knowing that you're a pharmacy technician working in pharmacies. There are sometimes, uh, you know, stipulations or requirements to get on that list, such as a background check, fingerprints, um, paying a fee in some cases. Uh, and then there's licensure. Licensure consists of also being on a list, but usually comes with an education component requirement to be licensed in the state. And then you also receive a license where you could hang on the wall in the pharmacy, similar to what pharmacists have. So the third is certification, and this is completely independent of board regula regulation. Board regulators sometimes include, so certification is typically, uh, or is generally uh, put forth by an independent organization that develops a certification exam um, that determines competency for that career or that specialty. Oftentimes, regulatory bodies include certification in pathways to licensure and or registration. Um, so how many here are registered with your state board of pharmacy? Is anybody here licensed with their board of pharmacy? Licensed? Excellent. Yes in California. Okay, yes and yes. Is it? Um, and then how about certified? Is anybody certified here? Okay, excellent. And was your certification a pathway to registration and or licensure? Thank you. It wasn't a requirement or anything like that, that was independently done. Okay. Um, there's also employer training that is, can be community-based or hospital-based. And again, this is, we're talking about the points of entry for pharmacy technicians into the career. Um, Formal education, so accredited programs and non-accredited programs. Accredited programs have actually been around since the early 1980s. Um, there haven't been that many, back, there weren't that many back then, but there are just under 400 accredited programs around the United States now. It's not necessarily a requirement, 
Um, some boards of pharmacy, there are a few states that do require completion of accredited training in order to register and or license with that state. An example would be North Dakota or Louisiana. And then there are non-accredited programs. Um, we're seeing everything from high school programs. I don't think this microphone likes me. I'll just give it up. <laughs> um, high school programs that teach alongside other health professions. So we're seeing where allied health professions, nursing, uh, medical assistant, dental hygienist, pharmacy technicians, phlebotomy, they're all being educated together and then being carved out into their specialized tracks at the high school level. Some of that includes dual enrollment with vocation or, um, community colleges. So you can get college credit as a senior in high school or sometimes in certain cases, a junior in high school. Um, and then vocational schools that focus in allied health some specific to pharmacy technicians. So just by show of hands, um, did anybody here complete a formal education or training program in order to become certified or licensed slash registered with your states? You did? Okay, was it an accredited program? Okay, excellent. Cool. Yeah. It's kind of an employer, but, but yeah. Yeah, okay. So you did your training at the employer uh, led by pharmacists with pretty much all of the techs because state licensing requirement was coming up, so we started doing the training. And everything like that. Yeah, I, I got certified and registered the exact same pathway. So, by a show of hands, did anybody come into being a pharmacy technician by saying, I want to become a pharmacy technician, or did we all find this accidentally? Anybody? They want to volunteer if they were like, I'm dreaming of being a pharmacy technician. <laughs> no? Well, I'll say for me, um, because I was working in retail clothing and I have a cohort who knew I wanted to go into medicine. So she found a flyer that was offering a pharmacy technician course. And I'm the first time I've ever heard of the pharmacy technician. So I just took the course and went from there. And I was Oh, cool. Excellent. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, what we're finding is a lot of people find the career of being a pharmacy technician accidentally, um, either by word of mouth from somebody who knew what pharmacy technicians were or we knew a, you know, a pharmacist from being a family or a friend. Sometimes it's our first job as a 16-year-old working at a pharmacy, a local independent pharmacy or something like that, and just stumbling it in, into it that way. Um, but there are so many different points of entry to become a pharmacy technician. And then there are also um, board approved exams. So I mentioned certification as being kind of a standout from board regulation, but often being a pathway to regulation. Um, so there's the PTCE, that's the pharmacy technician certification exam, that's by PTCB. Uh, there's the ACCEPT exam that's put on by, or administered by NHA, the National Health Career Association. And then there are various states that have certifications. Um, and then there are some leftovers still that have like employer-based exams that some boards of pharmacy have recognized. Uh, we're seeing that get less and less as the regulations kind of expand for all of pharmacy practice um, so that everybody kind of becomes a little bit more cohesive in the way that we enter the field of being a pharmacy technician. Um, so I think it's very interesting to hear different stories of how people found being a, becoming a pharmacy technician and their requirements, you know, forcing you to, not forcing you, but like kind of carving the path for you to, you could, you could have chosen to say, I don't want to do this anymore because of those requirements, or, you know, I'm not interested in doing that or up, keeping up with that stuff. But you obviously were drawn to the career, so you stuck with it. So I think it's really interesting to see um, all the various points of entry to be a pharmacy technician, but I also think that this shows that there's probably an opportunity for us to have a, like a, almost a national way to say like, I did this, I did this, and now I'm a pharmacy technician, and I can work as a pharmacy technician, um, and whatever this and that are, and, you know, that's not for me to decide, but we'll talk a little bit more about uh, state regulations here. So there are 48 states and jurisdictions, so the, um, like Puerto Rico, DC, Guam, US Virgin Islands, and the states require registration or licensure of their pharmacy technicians. 18 states require national certification, and that is 
um, in order, that's for a pathway to registration and or licensure. Uh, there are fewer states that require maintaining that certification, um, which is kind of surprising that a regulatory body would say you have to be certified in order to be registered with our state, but you don't have to keep that certification. Uh, but that's a conversation for <laughs> somebody above my pay grade. Um, there are 14 states with technician representation on Board of Pharmacy. This is something I like to really talk about. Uh, when I started at PTCB in 2013, there were less than nine, I think there were four states that had pharmacy technician seats that weren't public members on their Board of Pharmacy. I've seen this number expand greatly, and there was just research uh, presented at the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy meeting in May that um, they put forth resolutions to all the state boards to include at least one seat for a pharmacy technician in all 50 states. And I think we're starting to see a conversation move in that direction, because why not? Like, pharmacy technicians should be part of the conversation to decide what our requirements are for registration, for licensure, for certification, for education, because we all do that. We've all been through it. Um, there are 21 states that allow for technician product verification. This, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this in a few slides, but this was formerly known as Tech Check Tech. Sometimes it's still called Tech Check Tech, but there are many different ways where a pharmacy technician can be checking different things like, you know, uh, prepackaged or a cart that isn't, that wasn't necessarily put together by another technician, but maybe um, robot, robots or something like that. There are 24 states now that allow technicians to administer immunizations, and this is beyond the PREP Act that allowed uh, the administration of COVID vaccination federally. If you're trained and certified, um, pharmacy technicians were allowed on a federal level to administer the COVID vaccination, but there are 24 states and counting. Um, this is moving so fast that this slide actually might be out of date, uh, that more and more states are coming on board. And it's not just for COVID. It's for many other things that pharmacy technicians are um, uh, being able to administer vaccinations for. So there are a lot of states uh, that are doing things, but there is one state that is lagging. Um, I don't, I hope nobody's from Hawaii. I don't want to put them on blast or anything like that. But Hawaii is the very last state that doesn't um, have any type of regulations underway for pharmacy technician. They did just start a focus group. Um, with their State Board of Pharmacy and their Colleges of Pharmacy. So I'm hoping that that leads to something forward, at least for registration. Because if you think about it from a pharmacy technician point of view who doesn't know anything about pharmacy, um, other than that's where pills come from, like if I'm not registered with the Board of Pharmacy, I can go to Grandpa Joe's Pharmacy on one corner and I can work there as a pharmacy technician and steal everything that I can go sell on the street and then I can go down to Walgreens and get hired at Walgreens, and they would not know anything that I, you know, that anything happened if I was let go from that job because it's not reported back to the board or anything. You're not on any type of registry, registry for being a pharmacy technician, so there's no tracking of anything negative against what you've done, may or may not have done as a pharmacy technician. Um, there were a number of states prior to 2020. Uh, I think the there were like five states that didn't have any regulation for pharmacy technicians. Um, so it's exciting to see in a very short period of time that number go down to one, and I hope that's zero next year. <laughs> that's excellent. Yeah. Also, one thing about the, um, the requirement for national certification, there are, so that 477,000 number of pharmacy technicians around the United States as identified by the BLS, that doesn't say if they're certified or not, but PTCB has roughly 280,000 certified pharmacy technicians, um, and I think NHA has upwards of 30,000, and then that's not counting all the various state exams and the um, employer-based exams to count towards certification. So I think there are best practices in place that are drawing pharmacy technicians to maintain that certification, to continue their education um, for whatever reason. You know, either they're committed to being pharmacy technicians 
and, or their employers are requiring it. So let's talk a little bit about pharmacy technician job satisfaction. Uh, PTCB did a workforce uh, study in conjunction with um, various boards of pharmacy. So we did, we got roughly 20,000 responses of certified technicians and uncertified technicians. And as a certified pharmacy technician myself, I was extremely surprised at the findings here. Um, so just under half are very, very satisfied uh, working as a pharmacy technician. So if you're not afraid to show it, are you satisfied working as a pharmacy technician? Yeah? Some of you may have filled out this survey, I'm not sure. Um, but somewhat satisfied, and then it drops really quickly to minimal numbers for neither satisfied or dissatisfied, somewhat dissatisfied or very dissatisfied. I hope nobody here is very dissatisfied working as a pharmacy technician. Um, but I found this promising because I think that the more people who are very satisfied with working as a pharmacy technician might serve as a platform to draw people to the career of being a pharmacy technician. Everybody knows there's pharmacy technician shortages. I mean, is anybody here working at an employer that hasn't said we need more pharmacy technicians? No. Yeah, it's a national trend and it's been going on um, for quite some time. So I think there's a lot of talk of like how do you make a profession attractive to younger generations of like I'm just learning about science and I'm good at science but maybe I'm not get cut out for college and to be a pharmacist four plus four in some cases four plus seven or four plus three six seven eight years whatever there are very capable people who could be very strong pharmacy technicians that might not even know that the career exists so I think this is promising to know that there are lots of people who are satisfied working as pharmacy technicians. Um, and if we can get a way to convey that message through associations, through social media, something, I don't know, it has to be almost organic to have people learn about being a pharmacy technician or the pharmacy profession in general. We asked what would increase job satisfaction? So the highest response was I think probably to nobody's surprise, um, an increase in hourly pay. Uh, I will say, adding on to that, you can't just throw money at a problem and make it and have that be sustainable and last and draw people to a profession. Uh, the second highest response was opportunity to advance, which I think is really exciting because that's what's happening to the pharmacy profession. So I think people are listening, and by people I mean employers and regula regulators. Um, more responsibility as a team member. I think that question, or the, the response here um, is, it's, I guess it's powerful to say team member because does that mean a team member on the healthcare team as a whole? Does that mean team member in the pharmacy? Or like how, who defines what that team member means? But I like to think of it as if I were answering this survey, a team member, like a healthcare team member as a whole. Um, interdisciplinary education like cross-training, not necessarily cross-training about roles and responsibilities, but like the responsibilities of pharmacy technician to, as it pertains to a nursing staff, for example, like nurses being educated on the difference between a pharmacist and a pharmacy technician. Um, I think having pharmacy technicians recognized as pharmacy technicians, and then also being recognized for advanced roles and the ability to do advanced things um, is extremely important for job satisfaction because we've heard this before and I'm so happy that it's going away and I hope I never have to say this again, but just technicians is starting to go away. Like I'm starting to hear it less and less and less. But how many of, if, you're, if you feel like sharing, how many of you have ever felt like just a technician? Yes. Yeah, me too. I'm right there with you. Um, I think that's changing, though. I, I, in my role at PTCB, I get to talk with a lot of employers, and it's moved beyond how much do we have to pay them to keep them, which is insulting, I think, if you ask me, compared to what we do, what we're capable of doing. Um, it's more than that. It's more than just money. It is 
hourly, it, it is an increase in hourly pay, but it also comes with more responsibility. It comes with recognition, promotions, um, and the opportunity to advance, which we'll, I'll talk about here in a few slides. Is there anything else on here that you think might be missing from job satisfaction? It is, if it's small, it's better benefits, better schedule. Those are the lowest responses. Professional recognition, so like certificate, other ways to differentiate um, technicians from other staff roles, a title change, opportunity advance, so like career ladders, promotions, financial increase, um, or more responsibility as a team member. I think anything's missing here? It's not a trick question, just throwing it out there to see. That's okay if not. <laughs> Now we'll talk a little bit about the advanced pharmacy technician roles. This is a list of some examples of advanced roles for pharmacy technicians. I won't read them all to you, but do any of you, by a show of hands, consider yourselves in an advanced role as a pharmacy technician? That's excellent. Good number of hands here. Um, is your, anybody have their title up here or something similar? Excellent. Anybody care to share? Uh, I'm the okay, excellent. Excellent. Cool, very cool. Yeah. No, no. Um, yeah, it's not an exhaustive list of advanced roles, but uh, that is something that I wish I would have included on here. Um, especially as being the secretary of the PTEC, Pharmacy Technician Educators Council. Um, but the, that is one thing that we are seeing a lot more of. And this is something that I found rather interesting, is when talking to pharmacy technician educators, whether director of education, um, faculty, adjunct faculty, we're seeing a lot of people who don't realize that they're pharmacy technician preceptors, which we hear, that, we hear the term preceptor a lot, and it refers to pharmacy students. But how many of you, show of hands, have trained a pharmacy technician at work and taught them how to do what you do? Right. I think all of us at one point in our career as a pharmacy technician have been a preceptor, whether it was recognized or not. So I hope that changes a little bit so that pharmacy technicians teaching other pharmacy technicians um, isn't looked at as an advanced role, but is recognized as one of our strengths. Now I'll do a brief, well, kind of brief case study of a technician who has done advanced roles in her, um, at her hospital. This is Mika Stillwell. She's a CPHT advanced and CSPT, that's uh, the compounded sterile preparation technician certification in Lansing, Kansas. So like all of us, very, various different ways to earn CPHT Advanced. And this is CPHT Advanced. This is a, an advanced certification that PTCB provides once you've earned um, three certificates plus CSPT or four assessment-based certificates. So what Mika did was she was a certified pharmacy technician, and then she began doing sterile compounding. When we launched CSPT certification, she sat for that exam and became CSPT certified. And then she realized that with these other advanced roles that she was doing, technician product verification, medication history, billing and reimbursement, she could sit for other assessment-based certificates and earn CPHT advanced. What's great about CPHT advanced is we are starting to see employers respond to the different assessment-based certificate programs, CPHT advanced, um, in their career ladders and a new term, uh, career lattices, so that there's lateral movement, uh, which I'll have an example for towards the end of the presentation. Um, but what's great about this is now Mika's journey can be recognized by earning certificates. Her employer has recognized it because they've then turned around and built, with her assistance, a career ladder 
and opportunities for advancement, which is important to pharmacy technicians. So just one example of uh, an advanced role that Nico is doing is technician product verification. I mentioned earlier, this is formerly known as Tech Check Tech. In some places, it still is called Tech Check Tech or you know, uh, referred to as Tech Check Tech. It's a little difficult to say. Um, technician product verification, or TPV, is much easier and a little bit more accurate to describe what technicians do in TPV. There are even studies that demonstrate that specially trained pharmacy technicians can perform this task as accurately as pharmacists, probably to nobody's surprise here. There are some key research findings. Um, pharmacy technicians are accurate in checking refill prescriptions while helping pharmacists increase time providing patient care. So that should be an obvious one. Um, and in one study, community pharmacies were able to implement one or more clinical services after they implemented uh, technician product verification in their pharmacies. Does anybody here perform technician product verification on a day-to-day -day basis? Excellent. Are you checking the work of another technician? If you feel like sharing, or yeah, is I'm it? A compounding technician, and we're technically not called a pharmacy. We're a compounding suite in an ambulatory cancer center, and we check other techs. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? A technician product verifier or tech check tech? Yeah. Okay. All right. So this is some um, key data pulled from the TPV study. And the link, I, the slides are all available to you, but the, there's a link at the bottom for the reference here. This is a really interesting study if you're interested in this type of thing. Um, the accuracy rate for a pharmacist verified and technician verified, you'll see the technician verified accuracy rate is actually higher than that of the pharmacist. Um, Dispensing activities for the pharmacist before technician product verification were 61%. That's really high, if you ask me. And also, if you're an employer and you're paying a pharmacy technician or a pharmacist to do this 61% of the time, that's a lot of money that a technician can do, especially after implementing technician product verification, it went down to 13.7%. And then patient care activities were down 25.9% percent. Um, and this is for the pharmacist doing, performing actual direct patient care. After they implemented technician product verification, it went up to almost 60 percent. So you see that switch where the dispensing activities were at 60 percent and they dropped and then the patient care activities went up to almost 60 percent. So over half of their time. Um, I think that's excellent um, proof and this study has been actually used to inform other states. If you think back to the um, slide with the state regulations on it where there are 21 states that allow TPV, we've allowed technician product verification in the United States uh, in various states for a very long time, um, since the 70s, I believe, where even before, before pharmacy technicians were considered pharmacy technicians, where we were clerks and assistants and things like that. But it was primarily being done in a health system setting. So, which you can understand that, you know, the pharmacist will always have the final check on that, but it wasn't until um, late 80s, 90s that community pharmacy was doing it, and then a study in Iowa, which is what's referenced here, um, was piloted in community settings after they were trained by health system technician product verifiers to implement that at the community level, and that's where these study findings come from, which I think is very powerful data to tell regulators to say technicians can do this, and also look what happens when your pharmacist can spend more time doing direct patient care, and your technicians are doing more of the dispensing activities. Anybody have any questions, comments on technician product verification? Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember that, like, tech, tech, tech is validation? Yeah. So is that gone to the wayside and it's verified for both? Yeah, I have not seen the term validation be used, but I have participated in many board meetings <laughs> where this could take eight hours of a conversation, okay. which is very interesting. Um, and if technician product verification is up for discussion on your state board of pharmacy call, 
you should definitely call in and listen because you know board of pharmacy meetings are all public anyway so it's very interesting to hear everybody's opinions and perspectives on the difference between verification tech check tech and validation it's the same thing yeah yeah Yes. Yeah. That's I, in most cases. I don't think there are any regulations in place that have validation written with that word. Um, I could check for you, but I don't think it's anywhere firmly written. Um, there are a number of states that have done some relatively creative things. Idaho being one of those, where they've kind of wiped away all of their regulations for pharmacy technicians, and they're saying. Pharmacist, this is ultimately your license. So if you train and you trust your technicians and you know they meet the minimum requirements, we're allowing you to delegate whatever you want to them, which I think is really powerful. Um, I don't know where that will lead. I, there are a few other states moving in that direction. Um, I don't necessarily have an opinion on it. I think that in a state, I, so I practice as a pharmacy technician in the state of Ohio. Um, which has very loose, had at the time, very loose regulations for technician product verification slash tech check tech, where they didn't mention it at all, so we could do it, but it was like, it was checking um, if somebody pulled something from the stock room and put it on a cart to deliver it to the nursing unit, and it was like just normal saline solution, like a liter bag of it. There were certain pharmacists that required a pharmacist to check that the technician pulled a liter bag of normal saline solution. Um, which is understandable in some cases, but there were some pharmacists who were like, I trust these technicians on staff during this shift. Please just get this up there as quickly as possible because they need it, you know, rather than putting it in the queue for a pharmacist to check that 0.91 liter times 12 equals 0.91 liter times 12. All right, so our next case study is um, a woman by the name of Kimberly Metcalf. She's also a CPHT advanced, but this was a different approach. This, she is not a CSPT, so she doesn't do um, sterile compounding. And she works out of Cedar Falls, Iowa. So also a CPHT. Um, in this case, Kimberly did four assessment-based certificates because she was working in these four various advanced roles. So medication history, technician product verification, billing and reimbursement, and hazardous drug management, which allowed her to earn uh, CPHT advanced. Does anybody here work in hazardous drug management? Yeah. Um, medication history. Or, or med rec, sometimes they call it. You have it in the past? Okay. Any, there's nobody here with a title med history technician currently? Okay. That's what we're gonna talk about now um, with this specific case study. So medication history, trained pharmacy technicians contribute to the medication reconciliation process, med rec, uh, by collecting, documenting, and verifying medication information. Pharmacy technicians most commonly collect medication histories in community pharmacies, emergency departments, and ambulatory care clinics. Um, really every practice setting where the, we're able to do um, medication history. I don't know much about mail order. Um, does anybody here work in mail order pharmacy? I, I think there's less patient interaction there, but I, that might be a practice setting that doesn't necessarily do much medication history. Um, but you know, it's not, not happening in that environment. Some key research findings, uh, which is also linked here if you're interested in reading about it. In one health system, trained pharmacy technicians were able to increase the percentage of completed medication histories from 49% to 98%. So that's almost complete. That's, that's a lot. That's a huge jump. And I think what they were seeing is um, ER techs or nurses admitting patients didn't necessarily have the focus or the time or the, the patience to sit there and ask the patient what all their medications are on and why not send somebody who's fully capable of having a conversation about medications to help with that process. Um, and this is what's great about it, is annual net savings for the health system was estimated to be greater than $1.6 million. 
that's a lot when you're looking at something at, like from an accounting standpoint. Um, I, I find that very impressive. This was done in, let's see. Oh. No, it's not in the link there. It's not in the reference. But I do, I know the answer to this. I just cannot think of the name of where it was done. The old, my other presentation uh, has, slide, has slides about the exact hospital site and the process they went through. Because it was a big deal to like, have other teams, of other healthcare members of the healthcare team give up that responsibility and give it to pharmacy technicians. So they had to like rework some rules to allow for the pilot to do the study for this. Um, but I can look it up for you. Uh, so 6.1 medication discrepancies per patient um, and then 28.5 minutes to complete medication history. And this is estimated per patient cost avoidance of $210, roughly $210 per um, employer. So the comparison numbers I did have on my notes, but I don't have them written down with me. But this was much higher than when it was on other members of the healthcare team performing medication history. Upwards, like the upper teens, so like 18, 19 um, medication discrepancies per patient, which is, that's a lot, a, a big, big difference. Um, one thing I will say about this, uh, and the reason I wish I had that, the name of the hospital referenced and like where it happened, is there is a state that says uh, a, tech, a pharmacy technician having a conversation with a patient and the patient says my blood pressure medicine and describing the shape of the tablet is a clinical decision that is, that is supposed to be the responsible, responsibility of a pharmacist. Which is, <laughs> that <laughs> we all know what that answer is if somebody were to describe us exactly what the tablet looks like and what it's treating. We would know, you know. So the hoops that people had to jump through to get things changed to allow pharmacy technicians to just have those conversations. And another personal example is if a nurse called the pharmacy and said, can I mix this drug with dextrose or normal saline? As a pharmacy technician who has made that drug a hundred times, I know the answer to that, but I'm not legally allowed to tell them the answer to that. Like that's considered, you know, a, a clinical decision. Um, I think defining what that is uh, is probably shifting a little bit, um, but then you get into the semantics of, say, of identifying what, it, what that is and who, does, who makes that final decision. Um, but what's great about states like Idaho is if the pharmacist on duty trusts the pharmacy technician staff to make the answer, that's less time that the pharmacist has to answer a question that 13 other people in the pharmacy could answer that aren't pharmacists. So now um, I will talk about an employer example. But before I move on uh, to this employer example, by a show of hands, if you feel like it, um, if you've been a pharmacy technician for 20 years or more, if you feel like sharing. Yeah. OK. And if you feel like volunteering, did you have a career ladder or a career lattice or a structure when you came in to be a pharmacy technician? Did you know that there, did you see other opportunities other than being a pharmacy technician? Like were there opportunities laid out for you? No. Yeah. Yeah. Um, did, you re did anybody report to another pharmacy technician when they were hired as a pharmacy technician? Yes. OK. No? I find that, I find that interesting. Um, just because if I'm a, ph a prospective pharmacy technician and I'm being interviewed by a pharmacist, my, one of my questions would be, you know, what are my advancement opportunities? Or even if it's another technician, what are my advancement opportunities? And sometimes those advancement opportunities are, we have five tech ones, two tech twos and one tech one, and that person is 
maybe never leaving their job by the time you know you've been there 15 20 years so what does that look like as a long-term career for us as pharmacy technicians that's excluding any type of conversation about advanced roles and implementing things and growing a career ladder and developing it internally um, like your example so this um, academic health system system University of Missouri healthcare uh, this is kind of an anomaly um, although people are looking to this institution to build their own lattices and apply what they have done to their other uh, other locations other health systems um, and I will say that this is primarily focused in health system I think we see the first advancement of pharmacy technician opportunities and roles in the health system side and then the community side kind of catches up as they can fit it and make it apply, like with technician product verification, um, doing MTM, things like that. Uh, but again, regulations have to change in order for all of that to happen. So um, this was a really creative approach, and uh, they have six hospitals, they have 80 plus specialties, they have in and out, um, in and out patient pharmacy services, there are uh, 289 staff members, which is huge. 89 certified pharmacy technicians. Does anybody else here work with about 89, 80 pharmacy technicians, other pharmacy technicians? Yeah? Okay. Yeah. So that's why this is a little bit of an anomaly, but there are, we're seeing employers use this case study and kind of mold it to um, what their needs are. And we've even seen it in the community setting, which is very exciting. Um, this is relatively new, so this is probably really small. I don't know if you have the slides with you, but I can go through this. Um, so if we start at the bottom rung, there are 62 pharmacy technicians. Next to that is uh, a pharmacy driver. So they do outpatient and they do deliveries, and those are pharmacy technicians delivering the medications, and there are three of those. There are certified pharmacy technicians. They have 20 of them. So you see there's an entry level pharmacy technician that doesn't require certification. But if you are certified, you, you can move up if you wish to. They have different responsibilities, different roles that they perform. And then there's a patient financial advocate. So these are kind of on the same rung of the ladder, if you will. Um, but you can move in between the two. So I can be a pharmacy technician and become a driver, or I can be a driver and then work as a pharmacy technician. Also, if I'm on the second level, I can you know, work as a certified pharmacy technician, but I can also qualify to work as a patient uh, financial advocate. This next level is where you could go lateral to many places over a lot of time, honestly. Um, so medica our patient medication liaison, I'm starting over on the, the left. Uh, and then there's, a uh, there's 28 of those. Pharmacy technician coordinator, three of them. Advanced Certified Pharmacy Technician. So there's, here's an example of where they built the Advanced Certified Pharmacy Technician into their career ladder. Pharmacy Technician for Investigational Drug Services, uh, one of them. Pharmacy Technician Diversion, one. And then Pharmacy Technician Sterile Compounding. There are 14 technicians doing sterile compounding. So you can see where specialty or advanced roles, you can move on the same rung of the ladder. But if you have an interest in any of these, you just essentially move over. And it's a whole different job category. Um, the way they've developed it, they, made a, they pleaded a huge case to their HR and said, this is how we do, this is how we can retain pharmacy technicians. Because once you get to a certain level, you can start moving diagonally too. Like, if I skip up to the next run, revenue recovery specialist, one uh, pharmacy business analyst, so the 340B, there are three of them, three pharmacy buyers, and then uh, medication history technician, four of them. So if I'm working as a, pharmacy, a medication history pharmacy technician and I want to go and I get CPHT advanced and I want to apply for that advanced certified pharmacy technician spot on the rung below, I, you can do that and it applies to your medication history technician responsibility and your job title. So I think this is a great way to look at it rather than level one, level two, level three, and then like you meet requirements to jump to each level because we're all not the same in our interests, in our abilities, you know? I, so like that one, level one, level two, level three doesn't apply to all of us. And I think this is an exciting way to look at pharmacy technicians in the workplace to utilize all these different areas. And if you notice, they're not labeled 
with one, two, three, or four. And they actually have specific names that call out specific duties of what that pharmacy technician is doing. And that then eliminates almost completely just a technician because you're then relying on that person to be a pharmacy analyst of, you know, for 340B. And they take away, it, it doesn't really take away from being a pharmacy technician because you have to be a pharmacy technician to do that role, but that role is called out and it's not just pharmacy technician. So up to the next level, there is a pharmacy systems analyst, one of them, and then a reimbursement specialist, two. And then at the um, highest end of this example, there's a healthcare analytics um, senior specialist, and there's one of them who is a pharmacy technician. So this is, how do people feel about this, if you feel like sharing? Yeah, and um, the director at this health system, um, I met him at a conference, and believe it or not, that was HR's idea. That was not the pharmacy idea, which I, I found. I mean, they kind of came up with it together, but HR was like, we don't do this for other you know, areas of the hospital, so like, why are we putting technicians in a box by saying tech one, tech two, tech three? Let's call them what they do. And it, I mean, it's helped, like their retention is down. Uh, they are still looking for positions, but um, they, they're seeing a positive impact on their employees because they have specific goals on, and it's like specifically drawn out on what is needed to get to the next level or to move laterally. You know, I think exploring career interest, um, and then it, it obviously shows much room for advancement, especially if you come in as a pharmacy technician or a pharmacy driver. Yeah. So they don't have that as a job title, but they do have a person in that role, and they are one of these as well. Yeah. It's, they, and that, that person or those people have been like technician supervisors in the past is what they would call them. But um, I forget this specific example that they have, but the, uh, essentially the duties are outside, like they're not just managing technicians or like, you know, deciding on all of this. And they do have a very big collaborative culture. So that like the director of pharmacy the um, healthcare analyst, the senior specialist, like that would be, you could think of it as a supervisor, but that person doesn't necessarily have to supervise anybody. But if they do, they do. So they bring them all into the conversation on like their um, weekly meetings. So you have the, if you want to call it like the leader or like, you know, like the chief pharmacy technician or whoever, sitting right next to the director of pharmacy and right next to the clinical director, make, you know, having conversations about the needs for the hospital which I think is really creative. Yeah. And because they couldn't find technicians so that way, they didn't have to be certified by the state. And uh, so they were doing technician work, but they weren't calling them technicians to get away from the legal requirements. Oh, so interesting. It is interesting because if they would have just done something like this, they would have had the technicians wanting to do it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's working out well uh, from that for only because I have regular conversations with these folks. But the, um, the really cool thing is when they started posting job openings with these titles, they noticed people from the hospital were applying for the jobs. 
and they were like, this is even better because like we have to train them how to be a pharmacy technician and then get them certified if that, that is a requirement of one of the positions. But like hiring a new person and, tra and onboarding somebody and providing benefits is extremely expensive. So if they could do it internally and they're just like, you know, like cycling through different areas of the hospital, I, that's really beneficial to an institution, especially pertaining to like benefits and onboarding and things like that. All right. So that leads us to our first assessment question. Um, just true or false, studies have demonstrated that specially trained pharmacy technicians can perform technician product verification as accurately as pharmacists. True or false? That is true. Assessment question two, which of the following is required of an individual seeking to obtain the CPHT advanced credential? Um, I don't think I mentioned this one, but in my two examples, I did state that uh, CPHT is a requirement in order to earn the other assessment base, which would then lead to CPHT advanced. So um, B is the answer to this one, uh, an active PTCB CPHT. Assessment question three, how many states currently allow pharmacy technicians to engage in product verification? D is correct, it's 21. Number four, which of the following is an example of advanced pharmacy technician role? <laughs> yeah, all of the above, most definitely. Assessment question five, which state does not require pharmacy technicians to be registered or licensed? That is correct. And now I think we have a few minutes for questions. If anybody has any outstanding questions. No? Yes. So CSPT is a standalone certification, so it has to be maintained on an annual basis. So it's similar to CPHT. So you have to, you know, keep up with sterile compounding, and you do have to be working in it. It is not the other assessment-based certificates are not certifications; they're certificate programs. So uh, they each have their individual eligibility requirements. Medication history, for example, does have a work experience component to it. Yeah, so this CSPT certification is actually renewed on an annual basis, but because you're CPHT certified, we kind of do it all at once every two years, if that makes sense. But you have to submit, um, it, the testing is the same. You still go to a Pearson View testing center to sit for the CSPT, but there is an attestation from a supervisor that you perform sterile compounding and you do it accurately. Similar to like, um, uh, like the USP stuff. Yeah. Two part, two part question actually. I guess this part is for someone. So with the, the, the other people that are talking on the part of increasing the paper tax, which as a survey it was one thing that we do. PTCB lists out these courses which you know, they have to pay for, or we have to pay for them, yet they don't really come back into the salary increase for tax or whatever. So I guess how's the PTCB getting to help? combat that, I guess, is to push it across to people because you're spending money to pretty much get the thing, but it doesn't enact more income for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's an excellent question. First point of clarification, PTCB doesn't provide any of the courses. We don't sell the courses. Uh, we approve courses for the assessment-based certificate programs, and those ha they're required to be ACPE accredited so that you're earning CE while you're learning. So it counts toward your CPHT plus your assessment. -based. It, it uh, makes you eligible to sit for the assessment-based certificate. And then to the second part of the question is presentations like this happen in front of large employers like at ASHP mid-year um, at APHA. So PTCB doesn't necessarily do any advocacy, but we like to say what technicians do, what certified pharmacy technicians do, and the evidence of 
the assessment-based certificate programs and CPHT Advanced being built into career ladders and career lattices is being heard and being implemented. So we're hoping, and, and I should say, that also comes with title changes, raises, promotions, the things that are important to pharmacy technicians. That is happening. Um, it's a little bit of, when we launched the assessment-based certificate programs, it's a little bit of a chicken and egg kind of thing because to that point, we knew pharmacy technicians were doing them, but should we recognize them first with the assessment-based certificates or should the employers recognize them first? And thankfully, we've created them and then the employers are responding by recognizing them. And it's not happening immediately. Nothing in pharmacy moves quickly unless a pandemic happens, but uh, we don't want that to happen again. Um, so it is moving in that direction. The assessment based certificate. Yeah, it does look like all the bells. Like they have to maybe take the camera and show everything around it. It's completely empty and all that stuff. Yeah. And the, the sad thing is, like the Pearson, when you go there, they can't ever tell you anything. You know, it's like they won't tell you if you passed or not or completed. It's, they're just a proctor. Yeah. And they have no knowledge of what's going on. Yeah. They're kind of yeah. exactly the best group to work with. Yeah. The, um, I don't know the answer to like if that contract will ever go away. I know it's, it's working pretty well. PTCB as an organization believes in the strength of its exams and the security behind it and the importance of that. So I don't foresee it being easier, you know, to like just you know, walk into a room like this and take an exam. But I will say that online proctoring is again available for all of the assessment based certificate programs. So you can take it at home, but you still do have to do the camera test and all for the security purposes. Okay. Good questions. Excellent. Thank you. Right. There's my email if you have any questions. If you can see it, it's zgreen at ptcb.org. Thank so Thanks, much. everyone.